Um, this this type of um, technique is probably, out of the three, the least accurate. And the radio, and I would say the stone model is probably the most accurate. I'll, I'll kind of show you why and show you the discrepancies in accuracy um, with the different types of uh, techniques. So this is one where this is our bone reduction guide and then our surgical guide uh, that we fabricated just off of the CT scan in the software program. Um, and then here's the clinical image. We're extracting the dentition, and then we move on to use the bone reduction guide once all of the dentition is, is uh, extracted. And then the surgical guide fits on that bone reduction guide because we reduced the bone in the software, and then we fabricated the surgical guide on that reduced bone in the software. So it's going to fit exactly as long as the bone reduction guide is used properly, the surgical guide is going gonna, is gonna to fit properly as well. And this fit beautifully when, when we put it on there. And then this is the final outcome of that. Um, you'll notice, I mean, these would be tough angles to get if you were freehanding um, versus using a surgical guide for a case like this. So it worked out really great. And what we did on this case is we did an immediate temporization. And so uh, we used a model, and we did the entire surgery on the model. And then we prepared that, uh, the temporaries off of that. And so these two pictures depict the inaccuracies that can come from this, this type of method, which is very minimal for what we're doing. Um, you know, going from just the DICOM data, reducing the bone down, placing a surgical guide on top of that, and then immediate temporization. Um, the only discrepancies is this little gap here that you see. Because the model is what we did in the lab, and then the temporaries, this is <clears throat> in, during the surgery, we um, stopped the temporaries and used some foldable and made it adjust to how the implants were actually placed clinically versus how we placed them um, in the lab. And so you'll notice here, um, you'll notice here that you have a little bit of a gap here and a little bit of a gap here, which, again, a very small discrepancy for, for what we were doing and how we were using this type of technology. Um, so I wouldn't suggest immediate load for, you know, Final. So you definitely want to do immediate load for temporization or immediate temporization um, with the anticipation that there's going to be chair side adjustments at the time of surgery. Um, okay, case number two. This is a stone model surgery. And this one, as I said, I, I feel like this one's one of the more accurate out of the three. Um, but not all patients are a candidate. The, um, what makes a patient a candidate for this is the ability to see the occlusal surfaces. We have to be able to see the incisal edge. We have to be able to see every cusp and groove um, pretty clearly because what we do is we take a model and we merge that with the scan. So here's the scan of the patient. The patient's not wearing any type of appliance. It's just the DICOM scan. And then here is a stone model. And what we do is we transfer that to a digital um, replication. We have a digital duplicate of that model. So there's a few ways that, that we can digitize that model. One way, and this, does, this eliminates you shipping us a model, you can scan the patient and then scan the model with your DICOM. Um, or a more accurate way is you scan the patient, send us the model, and we use a high-powered STL scanner to make that digital duplicate. And the reason I say that's a lot more accurate is because when you scan your model on your CT or CBCT machine, then that's subject to the Hounsfield unit threshold, as I was discussing earlier. And we can still get very accurate results. We've done that a lot. It's, an, it's a quick and easy way to do it, um, especially if there's a lot of time constraints. It does take a few extra days for us to scan the model. Um, but um, the STL, what that is is it's surface only. And what you scan, there's no threshold that it's on. So what you scan is exactly what you get in your computer. And so that's what makes it pretty accurate. And so we take the original scan, we take the model, and then we merge that those two together, and we create, and then we treatment plan off it and create a surgical guide off of your model. And so this is the final surgical guide for that case. And so that's a really good technique. But if the patient has a lot of dental restoration, there's a lot of noise and scanner at the occlusal surface, then we won't be able to do it that way. Um, but if there's a lot of natural dentition, and there's enough natural dentition where we can get enough points to merge it um, accurately, then, then that's a really good option to go with. Um, the last method is our radiographic guide surgery. And this is 
the most common used radiographic guide surgery um, or the, radi the technique. Um, and so what we did, this is a maxillary arch. There's six set of percha markers in there. Um, we're doing two implants in the posterior. And uh, so we scanned the patient wearing the radiographic guide, scanned the guide by itself, merged it together, did the treatment plan, placed two implants in the posterior, and then fabricated the surgical guide. The implants were placed using the surgical guide. And then um, so it was, this one was done flapless. They did a tissue punch. I've seen it done a lot of different ways. I've seen them do a little window or I've seen them drill straight through the soft tissue. So that's personal preference. But, um, that's the more common approach or technique. So I want to cover the radiographic guide um, construction just because if this isn't built properly, then that third method won't work. Um, this, is, this is an example of a very nice looking surgical guide or radiographic guide. It's built really nice. So I'm going to go over the different details on why. Um, but this, uh, I'm, this is kind of an older technology. This is not a good radiographic guide to use. And I want to show you why, because I know there are some people in labs out there that are still using this type of technique. Um, but it is outdated. And the reason is uh, this concept came about, is a great idea, is when you scan the patient wearing the um, radiographic guide, you can't see the radiographic guide because it doesn't have any radiopaque substance in it. So what they decided is that they take an 8 to 10 percent barium mixture and create a crown with a really nice anatomical wax up and it's in the ideal state and, and location of, of the crown. Then when they scan the patient wearing it, you can see the crown. And then you can place the implant and you can see how the implant that, that emerges the emergence of the implant through the restorative space really clearly. So, um, but the only, I'm going to show you why that's a problem and, and a way to uh, solution to that. So what we're looking at, again, is uh, if we look down at the bottom, we see a little section of a, a panorex there. And we're going to look at this the yellow middle slice here. We're going to pull that out and lay it flat above there. So what we're looking at is you have a density in the bone, which represents the adjacent dentition, the, um, the distal edge of that uh, natural adjacent dentition. And then as we go up, we see these bright white um, areas or these bright densities, and that represents the mesial edge of that barium tooth. And so if we evaluate the bone in this area, we see on the buccal um, that there's significant bone loss at, at the buccal crestal area. And, um, but knowing what I know about cone beam images and how a radiopaque substance affects cone beam images, um, I, had the, I had them remove the barium guide and take another CT scan on the patient. And so we did that. It was the same patient, same type of CT scan um, within, you know, a week or so. And this is the new image. And you're going you're gonna to see that there is no bone loss on the, on the uh, buccal plate of bone. It actually is really solid. You have cortical plate that runs all the way up to the cortical plate. Um, and, and the reason that it looks like it gives us the illusion in the first one that there is bone loss on the buccal um, coronal aspect is because we're looking at a volumetric um, shadow here. And what that is is because we have this really high density, it's contrasted with this really low density. So I like to compare it to when someone takes your picture and that bright flash for the next few seconds, all you can see is a square representing that bl that bright flash. So conceptually, this is the same thing. We have this bright, bright area, and we're going to have this dark, dark shadow. And this is the picture. When you see the dark square, you know that there's stuff behind it. Um, and that's the same with the CT scan. We know there's anatomy behind that volumetric shadow. We just can't see it because it's a static image. Um, the other thing that I want you to notice is in the beginning, I said that the, one of the CT advantages for CT imaging is that there's um, um, that it doesn't affect a high density doesn't affect the entire scan, or the cone beam it does affect the entire scan. And you'll notice if you look at the trabecular pattern or the medullary bone space on both of these cross-sectional images, you'll notice the one without the barium, it's much clearer. And that's very critical, especially for a mandible if we're trying to look and see the, um, the canal and mark the canal. Especially in this case, it's really tough to see. It's marked slightly 
down here, but those cortical outlines aren't really well defined. And so it's really nice to have a, a better image that way as well. Um, so that's why we don't want to use Barum. There's other guides that are built as well. Um, we use little tiny data parcher markers. This particular guide, somebody want it, and it's another great idea. We're gonna, they're gonna place the barium at a vertical angle um, that projects the ideal profile emergence of the implant through the restorative space. And so there's these long vertical lines of gutta percha. The only problem with that is instead of them being small dots, when we merge the two scan, we, we scan the patient and then we scan the guide by itself and then we merge those two together. And when we merge those two together, there's a variant of or discrepancy of this entire vertical length. And you can see that in the cross sections below. The outline of the yellow here represents the guide. And you'll notice that on the facial plate of bone, it uh, doesn't go through the bone on the first image and it does on the other image. And that's just because it's moving up all those different points that are available through a long vertical um, tubular shape of gut approach there. So um, the models, as you can see, are so critical to be able to treat the plant surgically properly and have the restorative advantages. If you want us to build the model for us, we can. Otherwise, we can train a local lab. It's a pretty simple translation for them to do it um, as far as building a radiographic guide. Um, when you get your radiographic guide, you want to make sure it seats properly. It doesn't rock or move. One of, the, one of the big problems that we've seen is even though it's surgery, your surgical guide, the patient's not going to be included. At the time of scan, the patient's going to be including and if they get nervous and they clench and they grind, um, and, and if that radiographic guide isn't supported both on the buccal and the lingual, then they could possibly shift the, the placement and location of the radiographic guide. So when it's built, it should cover the entire crucial surface and have supporting acrylic on both the buccal and facial, so, so this is, there's no way that it can move even if they do um, clench down during the scan. Should be rigid material. Um, I've got a purchase marker placed are important if there are any more. If there's too much in the occlusal area and there's a lot of densities there, then you get lost in the occlusal area and we can't pick them out. So you want a deep lingual flange um, for us and then place them right at the bottom in the vestibule area so that we can pull them out pretty clearly. Um, so these are two really well-built surgical guides or radiographic guides to illustrate how they should be um, properly built. Uh, you can also do a duplicate denture as long as it's hard lined and, and it seats well. I would I always suggest a duplicate denture and ice denture. Um, and I'll show you why, but you can have the lab adjust it so you have ideal tooth location. Um, so Link's Dental Lab provided us some pictures. They took some pictures as they went through and built a radiographic guide. Um, and so this is gonna help as far as you know with labs and this is the type of I get a lot of labs actually asking me, what do you use to build it? What type of material? And you don't want to be sucked down. It can't be flexible. It's got to be rigid. And this is good material to use for that, um, the denture resin. Um, so again, Link's Dental Lab provided all these um, images for us. Um, we start with a model. And then they block it out. They do a duplicate denture. They do a wax prep. And then there's acrylic tooth in the uh, edentulous areas. So we can have a nice anatomical wax up in that area. And then they putty, and they put the putty on, boil it out, and then um, cure it. And so, and we have our, our uh, radiographic guide. And they use the model, make sure it seats. Properly and square, and then polish it out. And they're using a one millimeter burr, and they drill in one millimeter. And in this particular lab, we use this type of gutta flow, but you can use any type of, um, I would suggest metals, but you could do gutta percha, you could do, I've seen them do it with barium, that works fine. Uh, so any type of radiopaque substance in that area. And then this is the final guide. You'll notice that, um, you know, they put little holes here, so when you seat the guide, you're able to see that it's seating properly. Um, and, you know, sometimes if it's really, there's a lot of restorations and a lot of noise, sometimes it's nice to put in an extra gutta percha marker in case we're not able to see it. So, Six is the minimum, but, you know, eight.